service so far. I'm Nick, I think I know everyone on the screen out there. Um, it's very nice to be here, very nice to see lots of smiley faces. Um, we're going to be um, looking at uh, the reading which Kay read for us so nicely in 2 Timothy. So if you've got a Bible near you, uh, do please open up at 2 Timothy, uh, as I'll be referring to that uh, quite a bit. You'll find that just before the big book of Hebrews, and then go back a little bit further and you'll find 2 Timothy. But Hebrews then go back to Philemon and then Titus and then uh, 2 Timothy. Okay, well, for those of you who know me, I am a bit of a hoarder. Um, not of old newspapers uh, and, and rubbish. I, I hoard nice things uh, and I, I don't use them. Uh, it's something I inherited from my father rather bizarrely. You see, when I get new clothes, whether I'm given them or whether I buy them, I put them in the cupboard uh, and they tend to stay there. Uh, they become old and probably more unfashionable before I even get them out to wear them for fear of wearing them out and spoiling them. The same goes for other new stuff. I've got cupboards upstairs full of wonderful cycling equipment. I've got cycling bottles that don't even fit into a drawer. They're new and they're lovely and I'm saving them. I don't like to get new things out. It's weird and I'm rather embarrassed to uh, admit to that. Um, so imagine how I felt when a few years ago, uh, Val gave Sam, my youngest, one of my lovely new cycling bottles just to take onto a rugby pitch for heaven's sake, probably lose it as well. I was devastated. There's a lesson here for us because God gives us wonderful, great things and he wants us to use them. He doesn't want us to put them into our metaphorical cupboards and drawers and leave them there, hide them where he wants us to use them. Another thing that we might do is forget what God has given us. Might this be why Paul, in our reading today, was encouraging Timothy in verse 6 to fan into flame the gift of God? Was there perhaps something uh, not resembling a flame in Timothy's faith anymore? Had the passion and zeal perhaps faded somewhat? So here is Paul giving Timothy a timely reminder. Remember, he's saying, remember. In our home groups, for those of us who are in a, a Pusey or Mulder home group, we're working our way through the book of Joshua and the lead that Joshua took in taking the Israelites across the River Jordan. God instructed Joshua to take 12 stones from the middle of the river to Gilgal, some eight miles away, to make a sort of altar there. Why? Not simply a sort of quasi-religious thing to do, but so that people would remember what God has done in rescuing them and delivering them safely into Canaan, into the promised land. And in Joshua 4, verse 21, please don't turn there, it says, uh, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them he did this, so that all the people of the world might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. You see, as does it sounds, we need reminding sometimes of what God has promised us and how good he is. We discussed in our home group, uh, is forgetfulness perhaps the enemy of faith? Is forgetfulness the enemy of faith? Does the devil seek to help us forget so we think that we can survive perfectly well in this world, relying on our own strengths and talents day by day, rather than on God? So have a look at verse 13, if you've got it open in front of you. Have a look at, at verse 13 that was read to us. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Again here, Paul is reminding Timothy of what needs to be remembered. What he must do to honour God and live wholeheartedly for him. Now these thoughts will help us understand this passage. So let's have a look at uh, the passage in a little bit more detail, 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 to 14. And do keep your Bibles open, as we uh, will be looking down at this passage quite a bit. This is Paul's very last letter ever written, in about AD 67, while he was imprisoned in Rome. And things were very, very bleak. He was not under house arrest, which he may have been during his first imprisonment. This would have been a dungeon, 
uh, chained to a Roman guard 24 uh, seven and no chance of release. He knew he was going to die. The Emperor Nero uh, had begun a major campaign of persecution as part of his plan to shift blame for a huge fire in Rome uh, from himself onto Christians. And this persecution spread across the whole Roman Empire and would have included social ostracism, public torture and murder. So in his last letter ever written, Paul is writing to his good friend, Timothy, whom he may have met for the first time years ago during his first missionary journey when Paul visited Lystra, which is in southern Turkey. Have a look at verse five. It says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Maybe Timothy heard Paul preach in Lystra. We don't know. He might have seen him being stoned by the authorities there as part of the persecution. He certainly would have heard about that event. Timothy would not have been unfamiliar with the calling of a Christian to live wholeheartedly for Christ and to endure suffering. The two had lived side by side for some time. Timothy became a dear friend of Paul's, a devoted traveling companion, and sometime later, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to lead the church there. And it's while Timothy is in Ephesus that Paul now addresses this second letter to him. However, there's not a private letter of reminiscences between Paul and Timothy, a sort of catching up that has nothing to do with us today. This letter would have been read aloud in the church in Ephesus, and it's for us too. This is a pep talk, if you like, a, a captain sort of half-time talk for all of us who call ourselves Christians. People who, and let's just have a look down, let's just check this as we go through. People who call themselves Christians, people who, in verse five, have a sincere faith. People in verse seven, uh, who might feel timid at times, and maybe, out of our depth spiritually, who occasionally, verse eight, occasionally feel ashamed or embarrassed about being a Christian. And of course, it's a letter for those of us who are in need of encouragement from a very, very wise friend. And what encouragement Paul offers in this, his very last letter, explaining to Timothy, his sort of prodigy of what, what is of greatest importance. So firstly then, it's a call for us to be encouraged. Have a look at verse 6 again with you. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Timothy needed encouragement to recall the gifts that he had received when Paul had laid hands on him. He didn't need new revelations and new gifts, just the courage to hang on to the truth he had already received, and of course, to persevere. Now, Timothy strikes me as a rather sensitive soul, not your natural corporate leader of today. No mention of a father. Paul, in fact, calls him my dear son. Timothy was influenced in matters of faith, predominantly by his grandmother and mother. Paul remembered Timothy's tears when they parted, and he now encouraged him not to be timid, and not to be ashamed. Timothy was leading a church in Ephesus in AD 67, a time of sustained and indiscriminate persecution of the church. He'd lost, he had a, his lot was stacked against him and Paul knew this. Timothy was young and timid. He was presiding over a church where the authorities were looking for any reason to shut it down. And of course, his association with Paul would not have eased matters. And let's not forget that Timothy himself was of mixed race. He was half Greek and half Jewish. So he needed to hear from Paul, his mentor, this titan of faith. So how does Paul want to encourage him? Let's look a little bit further down at verse 7. Verse 7 says, for the, spirit of, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. Now, just an aside, I think you'll probably like this one. There was a, a newly appointed minister. And someone in the congregation wanted to encourage him the Saturday night before his very first sermon the next day on the Sunday. And then instead of uh, writing down 2, 2, Timothy verse, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, which is our reading, for the, spirit, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. 
he wrote the reference to 1 Timothy 1 verse 7, which when the new minister looked it up, it says, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they say confidently affirm. <laughs> so that's sure that went down very well. Anyway, back to our 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Please note here that Paul says the spirit God gave us. It does not say gave you, Timothy, or gave me, Paul, but gave us. In other words, it's addressed to all Christians. And what a fine triad of qualities these are. Power, love, and self-discipline. I wonder what qualities the world we live in uh, most admires. I wonder what you think the world seeks for itself uh, and approves of in others. Maybe riches, maybe influence, notoriety, good looks, fitness, success, power. Yes, the list may well have the word power in common, but let's agree the power the world wants is very different to the power that Paul has in mind here. Don't we see that the power men and women often seek in the world here is the sort of power that we can exert over others and wield for self-gain, to promote ourselves above others. The power that Paul is talking about here in verse 8, alongside uh, love and self-discipline, is the power of God to indwell us, to change us, to mould and influence us from the inside out. That's a pretty potent force if you think about it, and very different to the more shallow, self-gratifying power that the world craves. Imagine for a moment, if you will, the power that we need inside us, given by the Holy Spirit, to live for God in a fallen world, not to be sucked in and molded to the world's standards, not to give in to all the temptations around us, not to be beaten up and left broken by the lies and deceit of the evil one that seems to have mastery over so much of this world. This type of power, God's power in us, is tempered and made safe by love. And it's also made wise by God-given self-discipline. So it isn't power gone mad, fanatical and out of control and self-seeking. It's the power of God made perfect in fallen man. It is what we need in us to live wholeheartedly for God. And it's this power, if you look at verse 7, that God's spirit has already given us. So then firstly, we are to fan into flame the gifts we have received from God by acknowledging the resources at our disposal, power, love, and self-discipline. Let's not leave these best clothes, if you like, to use my analogy, hanging in our wardrobes. Let's get them out, enjoy them, encourage others to enjoy them too. Let's remember that they are there. Like those Israelites who crossed the Jordan had a permanent reminder of God's faithfulness every time they looked at those stones. And that pile of stones in Gilgal didn't just remind the Israelites of what God had done so powerfully. It was a talking point too. If you remember, Joshua 4.21 I read earlier said, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them he did this so that all the people of the world might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and that you might always fear the Lord your God. So secondly, we are to delight in the testimony about our Lord. Have a look at verses 8 to 10, if you would. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul is writing to Timothy, a young church leader, during a time of mounting persecution. He may have been afraid to continue preaching the gospel of Christ, his fears were based on fact because believers were being arrested and executed. Indeed, Timothy, like Paul, would later be jailed for preaching the gospel. 
But Paul tells him, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. In other words, don't be ashamed to talk about Jesus. What exactly then are we told to be bold in testifying about? Let's have a look at verses 9 to 10 and you will see that Paul has provided us with a rather nice summary of the gospel itself. It's all there. It says, if I paraphrase, God loved us and called us and sent Christ to die for us. We can have eternal life through faith in him because he broke the power of death with his resurrection. We do not deserve to be saved. That's what grace is. But God offers us salvation anyway, and that will result in our eternal rest after we die. Wow, there's a lot there. There's a few Old Testament prophecies. There's Christmas. There's Easter. There's our own personal salvation and heaven all rolled into a couple of verses. Let me just read those again for you. Verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of our but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He saved us, verse 9 starts. Saved us from what, you may well be asking. Well, in part, God has saved us from ourselves because we naturally seek and crave for what doesn't necessarily profit us. A chasing after the wind, the Bible calls it. Would we feel complete and in a better place if we had that perfect job, got straight A's in our exams, or if we lived in a nicer house? Not really. When I and mine becomes more important to us than he and his, God is not being on it. And it's often our self-centeredness that gets us into trouble. So we're saved from ourselves, but we are also, and more importantly, saved from the legitimate consequences of separation from God. You see, he created us to be in a loving relationship with him. This is what is described in Genesis. Humanity lived, moved, and enjoyed being in God's presence. But sin destroyed this perfect picture of fellowship. And that loving relationship was marred. You'll remember that man felt ashamed and embarrassed before God when he first sinned. This rebellion by humankind merited punishment. And here, the grace of God becomes our only hope. And that is why Paul mentions it in verse 9. You see, it's the linchpin of the gospel. Notice the definition of grace in verse 9. Not because of anything we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this is the power of the gospel that Paul wants to encourage Timothy with. Paul is not offering the type of assurance we often see in soap operas when someone says, you'll be right, I promise, everything's going to be fine. You'll be at, I'll make sure everything's going to be all right. When really have no idea if that's the case and certainly no control over it. Paul is saying here, everything will be fine because the saving power of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, which amazingly invites us back into a loving relationship with God again. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, verse 9. And if we accept that outrageous forgiveness, we're saved. That is why we can do nothing about it. How can our good acts, our decency, our integrity, our outreach events, coming to church, how, how can they nullify the punishment of God? These are all good things that we can do and be, but they certainly don't save us. The grace of God does. And later we're going to sing Amazing Grace, how it saved a wretch like me. You see, a wretch cannot save himself. That's the whole point. We know full well if God has put his hand on our shoulder and we've replied yes. And we also know if we haven't. And it's always the perfect time to come to God to say sorry. So why not today if you haven't already? So firstly then, 
we're to acknowledge the resources of power, love, and self-discipline at our disposal. Secondly, we're to fan into flame the gift of God, which is his grace. And thirdly now, have a look down with me, if you would please, at the very end of verse 12. We are to look more to that day than this. Now, just a quick look back at verse 11 for some context. Verse 11 says, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's pretty impressive. Herald, apostle and teacher. Amazing callings and words which inspire great awe in us. But where do these inevitably lead? Let's look now at the next verse. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard me, to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Paul is not obsessed about his suffering or impending death. In fact, we're hard pushed to know which letters Paul wrote chained as a prisoner and which he didn't. Paul does not dwell on himself and his own predicament, but prefers to focus rather on that day. Paul understood that if he followed Jesus wholeheartedly, it would inevitably lead to being stoned in Lystra or being run out of town, hounded, falsely accused, being in need, not knowing where the next meal may be coming from. Now, whilst this may not be the same for us in 21st century Britain, I'm sure we all know the fellow believers in other parts of the world for whom this runs horribly true. Whether it's mission partners needing to be careful about what they actually tell the authorities in order to get visas extended, or outright physical persecution and churches being burned. Nero might well have been holding Paul prisoner with his life in the balance, but he earns no copy in Paul's writing, not the least brushstroke of a quill. In fact, who even knew that Nero was emperor? I certainly didn't, and I started preparing this. He would be merely one of millions called to give an account of himself on that day, and history ends and Jesus returns. In our last Coffee Central, the week before last, Reuben uh, was leading us uh, in a thought from Matthew 6, which says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after such things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We were encouraged not to be in maintenance mode, seeking a life of comfortable ease, but rather to rise up and endure suffering and seek his kingdom and righteousness. Wise words then from Jesus to us and from Paul to Timothy here, to focus not so much on the troubles and difficulties of today, but to see these, these very much through the lens of our amazing inheritance of that day. I wonder how confident your view of the future is. If we have an earthbound view of the future, our present does not make a lot more sense than sleep, get up, eat, work, eat, do a bit of cycling, rest, rest, eat, uh, news at 10, and then uh, off to bed again. Paul's vista is so much wider. He says in verse 12, I know whom I have believed. Not what, but whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And what exactly has been entrusted to God until that day? Well, Paul's saved life, his very soul. Why else would Paul have been prepared to suffer so much? This is not arrogance on the part of a Christian. The world doesn't like people saying, I know. People don't like that nowadays, do they? It often offends politically correct sensibilities where relativism and pluralism must rule and everyone can know and be right at the same time. Let me ask you a question. If you were planning on taking up a little bit of cycling, maybe a sermon must get some cycling in it somewhere, would you listen to the likes of a professional cyclist, someone like Chris Froome? I think everyone knows Chris Froome, Bradley Wiggins. Um, if he or they were happy to share some of their wisdom on the sort of bike you may like to purchase for the Wiltshire Roads. 
And if he said, I know about your choice of bikes or clothing or training regime or nutrition, would you consider him arrogant? I think not, quite to the contrary. I imagine you'd be grateful for his insights and advice. So it is with Paul. It's not arrogance when he says, I know whom I have believed, but rather the invincible confidence of someone who had once lived on the wrong side of God, but had moved across to the right side. He had seen and tasted time and time again, God's faithfulness and goodness throughout his converted life. A life strengthened and honed on the anvil of suffering in godly service, not of a man-made philosophy or political doctrine, promising a better future, but on a person, the incarnate son of God, sent to restore that loving relationship with his father. Because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted him until that day. We too can share in that confidence as we look to that day and trust in the one to whom we have given our own lives in faith. So then, much to take from Paul's advice to Timothy, an older, faithful servant, passing on the torch, if you like, to the next generation of believers. Firstly, we don't leave God's good things in a cupboard, like I do with my nice clothes, but rather we're to fan into flame the resources of power, love, and self-discipline, which are already in us. That flame will ignite our faith and others will see it. Secondly, we're to acknowledge, testify to, that means to talk of the saving acts of God, his grace, in other words. And thirdly, we're to keep our eyes firmly fixed more on that day than this 